theme. And that's how it works. Inheritance within your own theme. Um, so that's kind of inheritance within the Drupal structure. But inheritance can also happen in your own theme. So if we were talking before about um, Node, and we were talking about how we're starting theming Node, content types of news, as opposed to just Node. So in your own theme, so it's going to go, Drupal is going to go through this process, and it's going to go through, da -da -da -da, Node, okay, cool. There's a Node in theme, theme wins. And then it's, also, then it's going to go, hang on a minute, this is a news node, this is a news content type, and I've got Node dash dash news. So that's going to get applied after Node. So in your theme itself, Inheritance within your theme works by being specific. So nodes going to get applied to every node. Node news is going to get applied to news. Um, and then field, TPL, that styling the images is going to come in the top and make the image, image fields within the news look the way that you've defined it in that TPL. So in your, within your theme, it goes from specific from general to specific. And that's always how that inheritance works. Um, on Drupal.org, so I've got up there, template suggestions. Um, this is from Drupal.org, says template suggestions are based on these factors. So listen from the most specific template to the least, Drupal will always use the most specific. Um, and there's a lot of documentation. I mean, the documentation is still really picking up for Drupal 7, but the theming documentation is fantastic. It really does go through a lot of what. Um, we're talking about to show some examples of naming conventions as well. So in Drupal templates, specific wings, right? So outside of our theme, we go in core module theme. Once we hit the theme level, then this inheritance is occurring. We go in node. No type, no node ID. So I might have a news content type that's node ID 50, and um, that's pretty much when I launch my new product, so I want to have this extra stuff coming in happening on that page. Then I can simply drop, I don't have to worry about changing all my news ones because it's only one for one. So I can drop in node 50, node ID 50, and that'll theme just that one. So it's, um, it's all about inheritance, yes. It's, you know, so you're, you're, you're inheriting, as we said, in the module side, you've got inheritance on the theme side, and then you've got inheritance within your own template. Um, so that, that's great, that's the TPO level. And that's pretty much describing what um, divs are getting wrapped around and everything else. Uh, sometimes you just want to do some basic CSS changes and styles. Um, and you start going into Firebug. Just a minute, ask the question as we start there. Yeah. So every one of these TDLs that we've written has to go into the theme.info the file. Yeah. No, theme.info file doesn't need to declare the TDL files. Yeah. So in the theme info, we're declaring what our regions are, the CSS files that we're bringing in, and we're also declaring the JavaScript that we're bringing in, um, but we don't need to declare TPL files anywhere. Drupal knows that they're existing because it's going through that inheritance process that we talked about. So as long as, I need to catch, I guess I should say that, um, as long as your templates are all sitting in one area, so you might have a theme called happy, and under that theme happy, you might have all your TPLs listed at the base level, that's fine, they've all got to be there. If you then have a template folder, you can also have a templates folder, so you've got templates and everything sits in there. So let's just say you've got node.tpl sitting inside your templates folder and you create a TPL for node-news, dash dash news, and you put that in your base folder, news isn't going to be a file because it needs to sit in the plain folder with the other, other template. So as long as it's doing that, the Drupal bridge track when it's going through and loading that page, you will see that it exists. So we, as long as we sit into the naming conventions, um, we don't have to tell Drupal how many themes or how many like, templates you're using. Um, 
Do you have fire bug on this if you don't? Fire? No, probably not. No, I think it's Anyway. Alright, so what I kind of wanted to do is just show you. You know, go back to the Drupal site, do a right click, inspect an element of the page. Sorry? Oh, it's okay. It's alright. It's okay. Um, I'm still angry at Opera for something. Um, but um, basically, if you open up a web browser, um, Firefox, and you right click, um, and you have a look at what a um, browser tool you use, and you have a look at an element, and you look in that, so five bugs great, because if you look in the right hand side, others do as well, they show you what the actual inheritance has been. When you look at a Drupal site, sometimes your inheritance is like this long. <laughs> so then you go out there. What the hell is going on there? Because how many inheritor are TPO files? We do the same thing obviously with our CSS files. So Drupal core itself has a lot of CSS. So we're looking at Node before. This is how are nodes built in the Drupal framework. They're coming from, we go straight under a Drupal 7 site, we've got a folder called modules, which is basically Drupal core. So every single module in here is really Drupal core. Uh, obviously, we don't need to turn them all on. That's pretty much where it calls it in. Let's go into Node. We can see straight away in Node, I've got a TPL file. That's what we're saying. If you don't have it, Drupal Core has it and it's going to play it. But there's no .css in there. So each one of these modules pretty much has a CSS, not all of them, but a lot of them have a CSS. So if you don't have that CSS and you're not thinking that, it's going to come up through the node, which is where you get this inheritance issue that becomes so annoying with the CSS. Oops. Oops. Um, um, CSS inheritance is probably the thing that I think scares. Um, a lot of scares, but frustrates a lot of people. So we said Drupal Core applies its own CSS files, it's called first. The Drupal modules that apply their own CSS files, they get called next. So Core gets applied, Core gets overwritten by a module. Your theme has its own CSS file, so your theme CSS then gets, then overwrites that module. So once again, your theme has the final say. How does that, there's two ways that it works, right? Um, okay, so we're going through and we're looking at our block and we see that there is a particular CSS in there um, called, uh, you know, this big block CSS, so the class might be called block margin, and it's applying um, a left and a right margin of 10 pixels, and it's applying that to every single um, block. And you go, you know what? I don't want 10 pixels either side. I really don't want it. Thanks for putting it there, Drupal, but I don't want it. How can I get rid of that? Um, so, I don't know. Can I? I look the same if you can't see that in your phone control. Um, So when we're looking at it and we're seeing that it's coming from node.css, 
right back in the thing. It's not no dot CSS that we're changing. We're putting that core in our own CSS. And that's how that inheritance is working. It's a lot taken, so <laughs> um, do's and don't. So what I was saying before, you see a CSS class on module dash node dash node CSS. Don't change the module dash node dash node CSS file. Never change that. That's a big don't. But you do copy the CSS core and you paste it into your own theme.css because your theme wins. Always. So as long as your theme has that form in it, it's going to override anything underneath it. Um, so that, that, that's looking at you know, particular tags, um, particular classes. So but what happens when um, I've got, I'm using a superfish menu, and the module has its own superfish.css, and I don't want to go through and copy every single class out of that, because I want to change the whole look of it. I open up the superfish module, I take a copy of that CSS, I put it within my own theme. In the info file, I place a little corner that says style sheet all equals uber, you know, superfish.css. And all of a sudden, the, the superfish CSS in my theme is going to override the one coming through the modules, the module. So that's how we override module styling and module themes is we go in there, we copy their CSS, and then we bring it out. One thing I love doing, and it's just my nerdy little thing, is um, I love admin menu in Drupal. Don't like the way it looks. Straight away, I'll grab admin.css from that menu, out of that module, put a call in my info file to it, put it to 12 pixels so I can actually see it, <laughs> um, and change a couple of other things around on it. And because it's in my theme, it's going to override the module theme. So you should never change what's in the, you're really not changing what's in the module. All our look and style, styling changing is really occurring in our theme. And we're just overriding and we're inheriting and we're overriding. Um, but it's scary. Um, so before we were calling dollar scripts, right, we are calling our PHP variable scripts. That's what it's outputting. And this is on a basic triple thing. This is Bartik, right? We've probably about four modules enabled. <laughs> so you can see straight away what I'm doing here is modules dash system dash system dot So I'm actually pulling through the core CSS, right? Then I've got so that's modules. Then site. So this is coming from the core modules. The top top section here is from the core modules. Second section is looking at site slash all slash model slash panels. So these are the contributed modules that I've put in. So then it's putting those in. And then right then you can see that I've got Bartik dash CSS. So then it's pulling in the CSS to my theme. This is a basic Drupal site. This is just a prototype that I've been knocking up and playing with. So this can get really complex. It can be kind of slightly scary to look at. Um, which is why, you know, when we want to see particular elements, it's really better to right click on that element and have a look at that structure um, from um, Firebug or something like that than trying to look at what is actually being output. Um, so that's kind of, yeah. That's the end I You can get this really quite, quite long. Um, where does this become annoying? A bit of a got ya. Um, so I was doing a thing ages ago now, but there was a particular thing and I handed a theme across um, to somebody for them to put on their site. And they called me up and going, hey, it's not working in IE. And I'm like, yeah, the round of things are going to be squared, but it's okay, we spoke about this. No, 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 it's not working. I'm getting a white screen of death. Um, <laughs> so yeah, in Drupal we have you know, a white screen of death. And just nothing's working and all you've got is a white screen. Um, you know, what am I white screen death? I'm like, well, maybe there's something wrong with your browser. I don't know. I've tried across three different computers and it's still there. Um, and what it was was um, because it was such a heavy module site, um, it was a very kind of heavy theme site as well, IE has a limit of about 30 style sheets, 30 style sheets that we can represent. 
And um, we were probably using about 50 something. <laughs> so I got to the point of 30 style sheets and went, eh, well, sorry, can't do anything. Um, that's why in Drupal you've got CSS compression. And what you can do with CSS compression is you can literally compress your 52 CSS style sheet into one style sheet. Um, and you've also got themes like Fusion and Adaptive and a couple of other base themes. And what they do is they have you to tick a little button that kind of says, yes, like, do, don't worry about the IE style sheet, you know, do your little um, magic there so IE doesn't see that it's 52 CSS and only keeps just a couple. Um, that was interesting because I didn't actually know I even did that um, until <laughs> I kind of hit it up against a couple of white screen decks. So. so, but it does, it, it looks, it's pretty intense. Um, so, it's a hell of a lot to take in. Um, and I, normally, because normally when I do this, we normally have a little bit more hands on stuff. Um, so, I kind of don't want to talk at you um, to I don't know like is there any any questions or is there anything that people are finding difficult in their theming area? Well you're using our sector because some of the four themes and the four sector. Sorry? What's your view on using our sector because you could have done the stock to Got. If you've got 40 something modules on your site, um, 
you know, and you do pull in CSS from all that, then you're going to be looking at doing that. You know what I mean? So it can come a bit more complex that way. It might be easier for you um, to do it that way as well. It's probably really just a personal preference from that perspective. Um, no Sorry? There's no performance going over. No, because you're compressing CSS anyway. So you're not like, where, where your performance is where you're looking at um, HTTP requests, so you're looking at get pull requests, yeah. right? So the more of that that's going on is, is what's defining your page load. Um, because Drupal does compress um, the scripts, and it is compressing the CSS a lot. Of JavaScript CSS, because of that, you're actually reducing those calls anyway. Um, I could really, really just be a personal approach. Do you want to say something, Ryan? Well, I guess I'm going to point out a couple of things. So, uh, if you're looking to get rid of this, like, you just literally want to start from scratch. Um, I think it's either the start or the mothership thing basically strips out mothership. all of, uh, um, maybe it's mothership one. Yeah. It strips out maybe. all of Drupal's um, styles and you just start um, clean. So, that might be a better starting place for you. There's also the other one I was going to point out to you as well. There's the style guide module, which can really help, not so much in overriding things, but at least seeing where all your styles are. Um, it gives you a really nice one page look of you know, all your messages, your login forms, and all that kind of stuff. So you can actually really highlight which things you need to highlight at a pen element level rather than actually at a, at a specific thing in your theme. Um, but yeah, there's also, there is actually a module that allows you to unset certain CSS styles. I don't remember what it is. It's, um, and I, if you haven't already, I, I, mean, I kind of haven't paid that much attention tonight. I think it's my stuff. But did yeah. you did you highlight the um, the, the developing module? We, we're not even there yet. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, we're not there yet. <laughs> That's the next section. Um, so start. I don't know. I think I, I think I mentioned start. Yes. Yeah, um, yeah. So basically, start comes in. Yeah. So that's a great one to see, you know, what, um, you know, what exactly default, the default markup in CSS is there. Um, but yeah, it, it's really just a matter of preference and personal choice, whether you find that easy or not. And whether you're handing a project off to a client for them to run with and make, I, I generally do, like, I'm not a maintainer. I'm an architect and builder and then I expect somebody else to maintain that code always. So because I take that approach, I try to make it, um, easy and follow kind of community standards and very drippily so the next person that doesn't come in and go, ah, <laughs> what has she done? So if you were doing that at the module level, it could maybe, I don't know, you know, when you're adding new models or something, but it's really a personal preference on that. Um, the other thing is reset. A lot of the module, a lot of the things you have actually use reset.tss um, and get rid of a lot of those kind of pattern and marginal issues and things like that. Um, I've had mixed experience with reset, so I used to use it quite a bit, I don't really use it anymore. So. The other one I was going to point out as well, sorry, okay. semantic views, that was the other one I was thinking of. Ah, semantic views, yeah. Yeah, it strips out a lot of the extraneous HTML yeah. stuff um, on your views, um, and you can make things uh, just cleaner. People that have a certain amount of HTML purity, like those kinds of things. Yeah, so we got, after the break, we put like a, a a couple more slides that kind of go into contributed themes versus base themes and why we want to use one or the other um, and stuff. But I guess really the key thing to take in is that inheritance. That inheritance always works and so your theme always wins. So you might get a really complex site and open it up and that site will have a lot of the CSS well to the future. It might have, um, but even, you could even create a you know that the clients are going to use admin menu, so you create a theme that actually has like the CSS or a theme there and things like that. You know, whatever you put in that theme is definitely going to be overriding everything else. Um, and you know, blocks, there's certain modules that, that you know are going to be in there, so it's pretty really easy to get into that module, grab that TPL, uh, put it into the yours, and go from there with it. But there is, there's enough of me <laughs> um, There is some pizza over there and stuff. So, feel free to grab some